Hello everyone, my name is Ala Sayed. I'm a fifth year medical student at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences. And today we're going to talk about tracks. This is the second part of the series, so you have to watch the first part before you watch this one. So the spinothalamic tract is actually divided into the lateral spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract, depending on which uh, part of the spinal cord are they running in. So if they run in the lateral column, they're called the lateral spinothalamic tract, and if they run in the anterior column, they're called the anterior spinothalamic tract. In general, the spinothalamic tract is actually responsible for carrying the following information to the cortex. Nondiscriminative touch, pain, temperature, and add to that, pressure. The properties of the anterolateral system, or the spinothalamic tract, is as follows. All the nerve fibers are relatively slow conducting fibers. And why is that? Because they're either lightly myelinated, a delta fibers or unmyelinated C fibers. Now all of these fibers have free nerve endings in the periphery and do not have specialized sensory transduction organelles associated with them. Now compare that to the dorsal column. The dorsal column was fast, the uh, neurons were myelinated, large diameter neurons, and also the uh, dorsal column actually have specialized sensory transduction organelles associated with the neurons. We'll start with the lateral spinothalamic tract. First of all, what does it carry to the brain? It carries pain. Now we have two types of pain, fast pain and slow pain. Now it's fast or slow depending on the fibers carrying that pain. So eight delta fibers are actually responsible for carrying the fast pain. Its receptors are actually located on the skin, so it's the kind of pain you get when someone slaps you on the face. It's fast, acute, so you feel it almost immediately, so you can respond, and that's because the fibers are actually a bit myelinated and they're really fast. So you can protect yourself or you can even fight back. So it's the kind of pain that is sharp, well localized also. Compare that with the slow pain. The slow pain is actually the throbbing kind of pain, the throbbing, burning, aching kind of pain. It's not well localized, so it's actually diffuse, dull kind of pain. Because it's carried by the unmyelinated C fibers, kind of pain is actually stimulated by changes in pH. Like when you exercise a lot and lactic acid builds up in your muscles, the next day you wake up with muscle aches. And also tissue destruction, like in arthritis. So so long time of tissue destruction will lead to the stimulation of those nerve endings or nerve fibers, so you get that kind of pain. The other sensation carried by this tract is actually temperature, it's carried by A delta fibers and also some C fibers. Starting with the lateral spinothalamic tract, how does it actually run through the CNS? Now starting from the limb, imagine a hand or a leg, free nerve endings carrying pain or temperature will actually move within the dorsal root ganglion where the cell bodies or the first order neuron actually lies. The central process of that neuron will actually reach the tip of the posterior gray horn. On the tip, but it's not shown in the picture, that central uh, process will actually send ascending and descending branches. Those ascending and descending branches will actually form a tract called the postrolateral tract of Lissier. And this means that, as you can see here, if this nerve ending entered through the sp uh, spinal cord through this segment, it won't actually end up in this segment. It will go either up or down through that tract to go into another segment, either two segments above, two to one segments above, or two to uh, one segment below that level of spinal cord. From there, that second order neuron will move obliquely and actually cross the midline in the anterior gray and white commissure. And when it crosses the midline, it reaches the lateral white column and moves upwards as the lateral spinothalamic tract. As the lateral spinothalamic tract finishes moving toward the spinal cord, it reaches the medulla oblongata. There, the lateral spinothalamic tract actually meets another tract. The other tract is, uh, is called the spinotectal tract. 
The second tract, the lateral spinothalamic tract, will actually meet at medulla oblongata, is the anterior spinothalamic tract. Now, just so you can imagine it even better, let's just explain a bit about the anterior spinothalamic tract. Now, the anterior spinothalamic tract actually begins the same way as the lateral spinothalamic tract. The only difference is that the anterior spinothalamic tract does not run in the lateral uh, column. Instead, it runs in the anterior column. So as it's running within the anterior column, let's imagine it's this one, it's running this way, and it reaches medulla oblongata, it goes and joins the lateral spin uh, spinothalamic tract. So the lateral spinothalamic tract joins the anterior spinothalamic tract within the medulla oblongata. So let's just talk briefly about the spinal textile tract. So now the spinal textile tract actually begins out of the spinal cord and it wants to reach the tectum within the midbrain. Here, imagine this is the spinotextile tract, it will actually join the lateral spinothalamic tract here at the level of the medulla oblongata. So the combination of the anterior spinothalamic tract in pink and the lateral spinothalamic tract here and the spinotextile tract will give you something called the spinal lemoniscus. The spinal lemoniscus will then move within the brainstem, and at the level of the midbrain, the lateral and the anterior spinothalamic tract will go to the thalamus and synapse with the third order neuron there. They will synapse with the third order neuron in the ventroposteral lateral nucleus. Remember this nucleus? It's the same nucleus that the dorsal column synapsed with. The third order neuron then leaves the posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus and through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, as you can see here, this is a posterior limb of the internal capsule, the nerve fibers will be joined tightly within that posterior limb of the internal capsule and after they leave the posterior limb of the internal capsule, they will move all around the cortex as corona radiata reaching different sensory areas of the sensory cortex. It's important to mention that the lateral spinothalamic tract does not only synapse with the nucleus within the thalamus, it also synapses with three other structures. One, the reticular formation. Two, the insular gyrus. And three, the cingulate gyrus. Because the lateral spinothalamic tract actually carries pain, it needs to synapse with those areas for more processing of pain. So when it synapses with the reticular formation, basically the reticular formation is uh, a bunch of neurons scattered within this, uh, the brainstem in the CNS. So the reticular formation is responsible to make you more um, like aware of the things going around you. It, stimulates the cortex, the cortex becomes more alert. So when the reticular formation is actually stimulated, you become more aware of the pain, especially of the chronic, nauseous, suffering type of pain. The second importance of the reticular formation is actually uh, the modulation of pain. So there's something called the descending analgesic pathway. So basically when uh, the lateral spinothalamic tract actually synapses with the reticular formation, the reticular formation will send neurons to the spinal cord. Those neurons will act on the spinal cord exactly here to inhibit more signals sent to the brain. The second synapse of the lateral spinothalamic tract is with the insular gyrus. Now, the insular gyrus is basically responsible for the autonomic aspect of pain. So when a patient gets pain, uh, you get this autonomic uh, symptoms like uh, sweating, uh, vomiting sensations, nausea. You get tachycardia. The last synapse is with the cingulate gyrus. Now, the cingulate gyrus is actually part of the limbic system. It's quite interesting. It's responsible for the emotional aspect of pain. So when you get pain, you actually get emotional. You're like, ouch, I don't like this. And listen to this. This is quite interesting. If you see someone other than you suffering or in pain, you actually don't like it. You feel sorry for them. So it's not only the pain you get, but it's also when you see other people suffering and also when you imagine pain. So, or you remember a past experience of pain, you get all emotional. This is all due to the cingulate gyrus. Moving on to the anterior spinothalamic tract, it carries two sensations. 
One, non-discriminative touch or crude touch, and the sensation of pressure. This is just to remind you of the anterior spinothalamic tract, but we already went through it. So first order neuron within the dorsal root ganglion, then the axon goes in through the posterior gray horn, synapses with the second order neuron in the uh, substantia gelatinosa, second order neuron passes and crosses over to the uh, other side, and uh, it moves in the anterior uh, column up to the medulla oblongata where it joins the lateral spinothalamic tract and the spinotectal tract. Then they move on, the second order neuron moves on and synapses with the third order neuron in the thalamus and the third order neuron will go within the internal capsule and from the internal capsule it will reach the sensory area within the cortex. This is basically a summary of what we mentioned but in words. And here's another picture if you want to go through it for the tracks. Those are the references. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, contact us email.